Now, the uh, government has had ample opportunity over the last three decades to actually address this issue. There have been repeated calls from the um, judiciary, governmental reports, as well as um, advocacy groups such as the um, Irish Stem Cell Foundation, but they have systematically failed to do so. Now, I should note that it is on the programme for government um, for 2011 that the uh, coalition has said they are going to introduce regulation, but they also have said they're going to address the abortion issue and they're also going to address assisted reproductive technologies. And I think it was actually last week in the newspaper, the Irish Times reported that they can actually only afford to either look at the abortion issue or assisted reproductive technologies, and they didn't even include stem cell research. So whether or not they're actually going to um, address it, we don't know. But anyways, um, to understand, I suppose, the development of stem cell policy in Ireland, if you can even call it that, you really have to look back at the abortion debate, which began in Ireland in 1983. And the amendment, which we w- I'm sure we all would know of, um, Article 43.3, and it states that the state acknowledges the right to life of the unborn and with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother, guarantees in its laws to respect and as far as practical, by his laws to defend and vindicate that right. Now, the biggest problem with this is this notion of the unborn. Nobody knows what it was. When this was introduced, the concept had never been discussed before in Irish law. And the um, Attorney General of the day actually flagged this issue. He asked whether or not uh, the unborn was meant to mean the embryo when it was fertilised, the embryo when it was implanted, or when an independent, viable life begins, whatever that might mean. Now, for the stem cell context, this is very important because if the unborn means from um, fertilisation, then the embryo in vitro, the embryo outside the womb, is constitutionally protected and stem cell research is unconstitutional. However, if it was to mean implantation, then stem cell research is permissible. Now, when this text actually went to the uh, Shannon, uh, Mary Robinson and Catherine McGuinness, who came on to become president and a Supreme Court judge, were actually um, senators at the time, and they flagged this issue. And Senator Catherine McGuinness actually proposed an amendment to state that the unborn was only to apply from implantation. So this would, would have cleared up any ambiguity in the law. However, the doll refused to do that, and the text passed as it is now. Now, dis- despite this uncertainty around the unborn, we actually we didn't have a lot of problems for the first 10 years. The first time we actually came to dis- uh, discuss it was in the X case. Now, for those of you who don't know, it, it concerned a 14-year-old girl who became pregnant as a v- result of statutory rape, and the issue was whether or not she could actually travel to England for the purposes of an abortion. Now, in saying that, in, in allowing um, the young girl to have an abortion, the Supreme Court criticised the lack of guidelines on the um, on Article 43.3 and said it's no longer fortunate, but it's inexcusable. Now, importantly for the stem cell context, they also said that the purpose of this um, of Article 43.3 was to constitutionally outlaw abortion. So this would imply, and um, much of the academics would agree, that this implies that the uh, unborn only applies from implantation. However, despite this criticism, the government chose to ignore the issue and hope that it would go away. Now, four year, three years later, in April of 1995, um, the government did appoint a constitutional review group. And in 1996, they reported. Now, the group analysed the entire constitution, but part of this was actually to look at Article 43.3. Now, their criticisms of it was that it's, there's no clarity, nobody knows what the unborn mean, that it could mean, as um, the Attorney General back in the 80s said, it could mean from fertilisation, implantation, or at some other point in time. Um, they recommended the introduction, introduction of legislation to define the unborn, and they also were concerned of what Im- impact it would have on assisted reproductive technologies and whether or not assisted reproductive uh, te- technologies were in fact unconstitutional. And by implication, this could have an impact on um, embryonic stem cell research. They also said that there was huge dangers if legislation isn't introduced <laughs> to govern this issue. Um, however, once again, the government actually set on, the, um, on this issue and um, ignored it. Now, meanwhile in Europe, we had um, a number of developments as uh, jurisdictions across Europe began to see the dangers with leaving this area unregulated. Now, in the UK, with the Human Reproduction and Embryology Act of 1990, that primarily concerned assisted reproductive technologies, but it has been amended uh, numerous times since, and uh, the most recent one is 2008, to regulate embryonic stem cell research. 
And in Germany, which has quite a restrictive um, system, we had the Stem Cell Act of 2002, and it has been amended to allow um, stem cell research, but on imported lines only. In France, we had the Bioethics Act of 2006. And interestingly, um, in Europe, they began to fund it in 2004 under free, uh, Framework Programme 6. Now, the Irish government was actually involved in the debates on this, and I believe it was Michal Martin of the time said that the Irish government was willing to allow embryonic stem cell research to be funded, even though, in his view, it wasn't constitutional in Ireland. So the government was saying it's okay for our taxes to be used to fund embryonic stem cell research as long as it's not actually being done in Ireland. Now, um, FP7, um, which is to go on until the end of 2013, also actually um, funds um, embryonic stem cell research. So if we bring it back to Ireland, um, we saw the new millennium saw some developments. In 2005, the Minister for Health appointed uh, the Commission on Assisted Human Reproduction, and part of their report, which was published in 2005, focused on stem cell research. Now, in their opinion, they stated that the uh, embryo in vitro is not constitutionally protected, and it is therefore permissible to... Um, uh, their stem cell research is um, permissible. But they did say that it should be only be allowed on spare embryos, which would otherwise be discarded. Uh, now, in 2008, we then have the Irish Council for Bioethics and their report, which was much of the recommendations were, were the same of the um, Commission of Re Human Reproduction, and they said that uh, research should be allowed on spare embryos, which would otherwise be destroyed, and this research should be aimed at alleviating human suffering. However, once again, we saw the government sit in this report and they actually responded by shutting down the um, council. Then in 2009, we had a, a decision from the Governing Authority of, of University Cork, uh, College Cork, and they said that they were actually going to allow embryonic stem cell research on its campus. Now, this was, despite no regulation in Ireland, at the time, it was thought that the embryo in vitro was constitutionally protected, and they still and they went ahead with this decision. Now, no research has um, actually been occurred in Cork because nobody's willing to fund it. But the government still refused to actually introduce regulation, even though it was obvious that this was more and more pressing issue that needs to be concerned. So with the government failing to do anything over the last 30 years, um, it actually came, fell to the uh, Supreme Court to decide this issue. And the issue came to a head in uh, 2010 with Road to Road. Uh, it concerned um, assisted reproductive technologies, and the couple had undergone IVF treatment, and there was eggs left, or embryos left over, but the couple had separated uh, Mrs. Roach wanted to implant the embryos, uh, Mr. Roach was against that. Um, so much of the case actually centred on whether or not the embryo in vitro was actually constitutionally protected or whether or not it came under the uh, definition of the unborn. Now the Supreme Court actually said it's not constitutionally protected, but they didn't say what level of uh, protection it actually has. It just said that, it said that this is a matter for the government. So in a stem cell context policy, what we have is a situation in which the embryo in vitro is not constitution protected, but we don't actually know its level of protection. By implication, it looks like embryonic stem cell research is, is permissible in Ireland, but this is not to stop the government to come in and uh, to legislatively ban um, embryonic stem cell research. So even though it's constitution permissible, they can still in fact ban it. Now the only um, development we have was the um, announcement um, after this decision from Science Foundation Ireland and the Health Research Boards that um, they had been directed from the Department of Health that they, would not they weren't allowed to fund um, stem cell research <coughs> while the department is considering these issues. But since this decision, we actually haven't had any legislation, we've had no regulations, and the ban on funding, public funding, still exists. This is only a ban on public funding, though. Any private um, funders can come into Ireland and fund it if they choose, if they choose to do. So what is our current policy? Uh, it's unclear. It, it's probably constitutionally okay, but legislatively we don't know if the government is going to do anything. Now this is, prior, this is problematic for three reasons. It's problematic for scientists, it's problematic for the research, and it's also very problematic for the economy. It is the reason, it's problematic for uh, scientists, as the scientists need guidelines. Um, in, we, we've discussed international collaboration. This is essential for the development of the scientists. But many international scientists will be unwilling, maybe unwilling to work with Irish scientists while the um, legislative, legislative situation is unclear. 
With regard to the research, uh, we need guidelines so that the public is confident that this research is conducted in a legal and e within a legal and ethical framework. This is essential. The public confidence is essential because otherwise we run the risk that the ba bad scientists, bad science. Uh, which is done by these rogue scientists which we've heard from the clinics across Europe or elsewhere in the world, they will then taint the good research which is con conducted in an ethical and a legal way. And finally, it's bad for the economy because uh, no investor is willing to invest in Ireland. UCC is an example um, because they don't know whether what, what is the current framework. For example, you know, we had Oliver Brussel who um, his, his research was funded by someone and then 12 years later it turned out you can't patent it. No investor will come in if they think that their work will be outlawed subsequently, otherwise it's a complete waste of their money, they won't see any return. And also we have a, a situation in this country where we have a, a set of guidelines for adult stem cell research anyways in NUIG, we may have another set of guidelines in UCC and we may have another set of guidelines in uh, UCD. Investors want to see this, a uniform um, gui guidelines across the board so that the ethical and legal framework is the same for everybody. This provides clarity for investors. So with these problems, well, what is the solution? Well, it's quite easy. All we need is introduction of regulations. And we're lucky because we've had two recent reports. We have the Commission on Assisted Human Reproduction and we have the Irish Council for Bioethics reports. And they, between those two reports, they consider the legal, ethical and scientific um, issues. So the government has to get up and engage with these reports, has to engage with the issues and most importantly, it must provide a transparent regulatory system which is clear for both public <coughs> and scientists. Okay. The key thing as well, it's not just, in, you know, affecting embryonic stem cell research with now the, you know, the introduction of induced pluripotent stem cell research which uses embryonic stem cells as, as controls. Uh, that's also impaired. And then, you know, the stem cell research then feeds into neuroscience and it feeds into drug screening, it feeds into a, a myriad number of, uh, of, of different areas because it's a platform technology. So effectively, you know, we're handicapping large portion of, uh, of medical science in Ireland now by not having any sort of legislation. And it, it's even worse than that again, because when you don't have legislation, you know, a, a scientist can be, uh, in, you know, kind of enticed to do things under the carpet and, uh, you know, and out of public view. And that's the wrong way science should be done. Science should be done openly and in, in the public domain uh, and, you know, the longer this situation goes on where there's no regulation, the better chance that there's going to be serious, uh, you know, um, a serious problem coming out. Because, you know, as we've seen with kind of, for example, the economy, lack of regulation invariably over time leads to some serious problems. And the fact that we've got a legislative vacuum pertaining to not just embryonic stem cell research, but also like things like assisted fertility treatments is, is very disturbing. Sorry, can I just ask you about the UCC case? Was there something about the, the, the cells being brought in from abroad? Was not yeah, at the time, what the if there was a constitutional ban on embryonic stem cell research, the reason for this is that the embryo is destroyed. Now, if the embryo is destroyed and the li line, the stem cell line is derived, say, in, in the UK, and we get a line from the stem cell bank, it was thought at the time that it's legal to actually import the stem cell line because technically the embryo isn't destroyed. It's like we export our abortion problem. We were exporting our um, uh, destruction of embryo problem. So that's how they were going to get around it. The issue just came down to funding. Now, I have spoken to Deirdre Madden and she said as far as she's aware in court that they, they aren't uh, doing it because of the lack of funding and that the, no organisation will come in while the situation is unclear. Okay. So just to, just to make it completely distinct, uh, abortion is a termination of a pregnancy. Uh, embryonic stem cells are taken from pre-pregnancy embryos. So embryos that have not formed part of a pregnancy. So actually, even though the two items are uh, commonly linked together in public debate, biologically they're distinct. Because once you take an embryo, a pre-implantation embryo uh, in, in a fertility clinic, that by itself doesn't have the capacity to go on then and develop into you know, a thinking, breathing person, for example. It's only if a pre-implantation embryo is introduced into the, into the womb uh, and attaches that then subsequently uh, 
further development you know can 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 occur and you get uh, a fetus but the key point that I was alluding to earlier is that embryonic cells are widely used in Irish labs and they have the same ethical and legal considerations sometimes they're even more complicated legal uh, considerations with the type of cells that are being used in labs so the fact that embryonic stem cells are not allowed to be used using government funds while other types of embryonic cells are allowed you know to be funded or to be used with government funds this this represents a serious you know uh, inconsistency which which we need to address Well, the biggest barrier is a lack of political will. Um, it, it's a political hot potato um, because people associate it too closely with the abortion debate. Um, it does not listen, it, there is quite a bit of an ignorance there on like you know the importance of the research, and also people don't realise that you do need to do research in tandem with adult stem cell research to really um, get the best. Now, quite simply, you could take um, the Commission of Assisted Human Reproduction or the Irish Council of Bioethics and their recommendations and turn it into a legislation. There's a huge amount of waste at the moment, like for example before that last point there where the HRB and SFI declared that they weren't going to fund um, uh, research that used embryonic stem cell research before legislation was clear. Lots of researchers were submitting proposals that either used embryonic stem cells or controls or were working directly on embryonic stem cells. And you know, people were writing grant applications and being invited to rent, write grant applications by government agencies and then when the grants were submitted then they decided that they couldn't fund that kind of research uh, at least for the interim and that, that represents a huge waste of researchers time that you know as we saw with the other cases as well with you know the assisted fertility you know citizens have to go all the way through the court system to find out what is legal and what is not legal like for example, like um, all the the sister fertility clinics, um, anecdotally they're telling us that they're almost full, and the couples who actually undergo their fertility treatment, they may have a child, they don't want to do it anymore, but they're being forced to freeze their embryos at a cost because nobody actually knows what to do. So it, it's an area which should be clear, cleared up quite soon because it's costly for couples who are undergoing sister reprodu reproductive, and also scientists may be quite happy to take those spare embryos if the couple do uh, wish to donate them. Could, could I ask, um, we have a long tradition of using the courts to establish social policy. Is there any scope for taking court action to provoke a situation that, that will end up, like, like I, I mean, what I'm thinking back to is the, the contraceptive um, thing where the, it went all the way to the Supreme Court with Mary Robinson and eventually the government did have to legislate. Now, I know there were a few bites at the cherry before we got what we have now, but is there any scope for going to the courts on this? At the, I would, you can, um, when you actually, when we talk about, discuss this in Galway, um, we always say, well, we don't know the policy because we haven't had a case yet, but the courts at, the, at those contraceptive cases were much different than they are today. We were in an, we were in an area back then in the 70s and 80s of quite a bit of judicial activism, which the courts took an initiative to read into the Constitution something which was not there. There's no right to privacy in the Constitution, but the court inferred that from its reading. We don't really have that Supreme Court now, and interestingly, actually, in the Roach case, um, the Chief Justice said that it wasn't, he said it was not judiciable, which means that it, this is not something that the courts can decide. So in other words, he said that it was not the court's role to determine whether or not the embryo in vitro, the embryo outside the womb, actually comes under the constitutional definition of the unborn. Now, I completely disagree with him and the other four judges did, because it's the court's uh, duty to interpret the constitution. But they were very, very reluctant um, and hesitant to actually say more than they had to. All they said is that the embryo in vitro is constitution protected and they made it clear that it is the um, government's role to decide elsewhere that if there is any level of respect or any level of protection it is now up for the government to sort out that issue and they're not doing it. Now you could have a case, I can't think of one at the top of my head, where they would be forced to make a decision. But it's very 
in the UK then what happens with the, with the embryos then people are obviously given a choice is that it? You, they're in, built into the legislation I'm open to correction on this um, but it, they have um, a five year when you go for um, assisted reproductive you're given a choice of what to do with your embryos you can store your embryos for up to five years and you the clinic will then say what do you want to do? After that, you are given the option of either deciding what you want to do or having another five years in which to store them. After that, you have to do something with them or else they will be destroyed. Because otherwise, we'll have a build-up of embryos, which nobody wants to do. Um, you have an option, obviously, to donate. You can donate them to an infertile couple. You can dis uh, discard them or you can donate them to research. Right. Um, that I'll just mention is that um, Beacon are coming into Ireland and they have announced three weeks ago that they're going to do um, uh, offer pre-implantation genetic diagnosis mm -hmm. and essentially this test allows you if you go to IVF and you have for I can say three embryos and there's a genetic uh, trait in your, in your family for example for Huntington's disease you can now test for that uh, trait and if the couple uh, decides that they don't want to implant that they will then discard the embryo which has a gene genetic predisposition to Huntington's disease. Now then we're getting very clearly into the discarding of the embryo. Now Beacon has not said whether or not it's going to discard the embryo or just freeze it indefinitely but it could be interesting to see what will happen when they actually start offering that test. They just store it? Probably yeah. I would if I was them. <laughs> That's the advice I'd give them. Um, Kira, if we, if we just let the constitution, mm -hmm. constitutional issues aside and the nuances, I suppose, of Irish society, if we're to model ourselves on another country in terms of legislation, uh, you know, in terms of how they've advanced it, um, be the most comprehensive and unbiased legislation, which, which country do you think would be your... Um, well, the current situation we actually have are very closely modelled on the US model. Um, we, we are dictated, the only regulations we have is by public funding. Um, so we are kind of closely related to them. Um, if we are going, I, I personally think the UK model is very good because they have so many structures in place and so many levels of approval that the, the public is certain that the ethical safeguards are met. There was a wide public conflict, like it, this started back in the 1980s with the Warnock report, which was the beginning of all that and all actually um, assisted reproductive uh, regulatory schemes are based on Warnock and a lot of what that report actually said. They have... Um, Throughout, they've, they've amended the uh, regulation numerous times, and this is important. Whatever regulation we do introduce, it will be frequently amended because the law has to keep pace with the science. It's going to be reactionary, but unfortunately, that's how the law deals with scientific developments. It has no other choice. But in the UK, they have like you know, House of Lords select committees that are constantly reviewing the issues. And as well, they do have challenges to the legislation just to clarify little, little nuances, such as like, you know, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. They didn't really know whether or not they could do it, but a challenge to the court, and groups are willing to take that, and the government are willing to pay for it as well, just to clarify their areas of law. So if we're going to model, while I'm not saying we should copy-paste the UK legislation, the model and the, the layers um, of approval that they have in place I is very good. Um, and, and, and certainly among scientists, it's, it's seen that the UK, uh, the, the, the law there is the most well informed in terms of developmental biology and what stages of life can you know do this what huge code of yeah. conduct which is on yeah. its ninth edition by now and, yeah. and it's independent which is important. Yeah. Um, you know, we have no really independent body since the Irish Council of Bioethics was shut down. Yeah. We're now one of the few jurisdictions in Europe which has no um, bioethics council which is something that we especially don't need because it's a group like that which can adequately inform the debate and educate people at a much better level than any governmental, because any governmental report would be tainted by, the, um, by politics, essentially, whereas the ICB was, can't, well, it is technically in, independent. Uh, and one of the, like, I mean, it feeds back in, into misinformation, like uh, embryo actually refers to many different kind of things, whether it's uh, implanted or non-implanted, whether it's part of a pregnancy or not, uh, and that then feeds back into the whole uh, people making up their minds on the basis of a misconception. Yeah. So, I mean... If you want to compare it to, yeah. I suppose, the cloning of embryos, yeah. so it's, that's tainted by the reproductive cloning, whereas people don't realise that there is not there is a distinction between therapeutic cloning and reproductive cloning, and that the therapeutic cloning is, if my esteem will correct me, but this is essential to the development of stem cell research and to get it to a, a therapy stage. So we need an awful lot of education to make sure people are aware of this. And it's only, I personally believe, through an independent group, it's something that Ireland really needs because of um, politics and how politics has developed on this issue in the last 30 years.
I, I would I would also say that like, I mean this problem is getting bigger. So for example, the discordance between Irish stem cell research and international stem cell research is getting greater and greater and greater. Um, and this and ultimately perfuses more and more medical research areas. So um, unfortunately, it isn't an issue. Uh, you know, like stem cell technology is, is a platform technology. It's not simply kind of an area of research we can pi pigeonhole away and it won't affect ancillary areas. It will uh, because it's, you know, platform technology and we're using these stem cells and the cells derived from them to study all these different neurodegenerative diseases and, you know, uh, a lot of other types of diseases. And it ultimately will impact our capacity to even attract pharmaceutical companies to Ireland because more and more pharmaceutical companies now are using stem cell modules in their drug development programs because conventional drug screening programs have a very high rate of attrition. A lot of them fail. So pharmaceutical companies are actively looking at other ways of making their drugs better targeted at an early stage so they don't lose as much money. And you know that, that involves stem cells. So by not legislating we're having a, an immediate economic uh, result from that, but then ultimately, you know, and more importantly, you know, uh, we're not engaging uh, in, in, a, in a pretty profound, complex societal problem. Mm -hmm.